Hey y'all, how y'all doing? I'm trying to get this hair in a ponytail. But I gotta talk to y'all about some shit cause it's been a minute since I've been live. And y'all know, I be talking about shit that's on my mind, like real life shit. And you know what's on my mind right now? Look at my little ponytail, I need to get my hair done. <laughs> I just finished working out so I'm a little like sweaty right now. Um, but I just took a little break from checking emails and whatnot. But yo, you know, you know what I want to talk about? And yo, my nail look crazy right now. Don't look at my nail, y'all. I'm getting it done soon. But look, what I'm noticing is that we are in Mercury retrograde right now. <laughs> and there's a lot of things that's coming to the forefront. Um, Mercury RX, right? Like, let's think about it for a moment. When we look at Mercury retrograde, when we look at the symbol of Mercury RX, like to me, it looks like a prescription right like it looks like a prescription a remedy like something to give us medicine medicine to heal but to heal what what does mercury deal with mercury deals with our thoughts mercury deals with communication mercury deals with travel right um and and sometimes we got to ask ourselves is there something that we're not communicating to others that we want to express is there like are, are we being stifled to communicate the way that we most feel comfortable okay and honestly, what I'm learning, the theme, the theme of the day <laughs> right now is attachment styles. And I'm noticing that, you know, there's people who have anxious attachment style and there's people who have avoidant attachment style. And what I've noticed is that people tend to track the opposite of what they are. And as frustrating as it can seem, um, Sometimes we attract our opposites because our opposite is what's supposed to help us grow and see past our shortcomings. Let me take my amulet out for the haters that be watching me, right? Um, basically, you know, anybody in here know about the attachment styles? If you don't, I'm just going to briefly describe it. Um, and I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm just a person going through healing and I do research. I talk to my therapist and I'm working on myself. I'm healing myself and I'm getting past these traumas and these childhood wounds in order for me to grow. And I share with my, my followers what I learned because I think that these tools can also help you, right? What I noticed is that we're going to talk about the two main attachment styles. I think there's like four of them or five of them, if I can recall, because they got like, um, like like subcategories and stuff like that like it gets really deep but basically your attachment style is how you connect to other people right like how do you get attached and i think that this this is formed in our childhood based upon like our parents our home what made us feel safe what made us feel abandoned things like that so people who have anxious attachment styles right like that's something that i'm working on People who have anxious attachment styles tend to be, um, they, they tend to be very like needy or clingy or they need constant reassurance from their partner so that they know that their partner still loves them, that their partner still cares about them. People who have anxious attachment style tend to deal with a lot of abandonment issues, right? Um, they, may, they may be the child that need a little bit more attention than the other siblings, and this could possibly be maybe, you know, maybe that child grew up in a home environment where, you know, maybe they felt lonely a lot or maybe their parents worked all the time and they didn't have that emotional, you know, nurturing that they need. And so these people tend to grow up to be um, people pleasers, right? Like they want to be, they want to make people happy. They don't want to be disappointed. They don't want to disappoint people. Like, you know, they go over and beyond to make everybody else feel loved and happy because they know what it feels like to not have that. Right. These are the people who grow up to be healers, to be therapists, to be um, uh, nurturers, to be teachers and things of that nature. Now, let's look at the avoidant attachment style, which they are the complete opposite. <laughs> OK, avoidant attachment style. People who have avoidant attachment style are normally people who um, they don't really like to cling. They hate clinginess. They need their space, right? Like when it comes to relationships, it's like they can be fine going days without speaking to their partner. Like they don't need to talk to you every day. Um, they don't like when people are all up in their space, like they need their space. And I find that people who have avoidant attachment style, um, these are people who tend to run from love. These are people who are not very open, people who are very closed off. And whenever they feel themselves falling in love or falling for somebody, they tend to run away or they tend to um, take a step back they detach 
right? And when we think about astrology, people who normally have avoidant attachment styles, the people who Venus sign is probably an Aquarius, people whose Venus sign is probably in um a, like an air sign, like a uh, Gemini. OK, uh, but I noticed like people, even sun signs, like people who are a little bit more detached, um, Sagittarius is OK. Um, who else? Aries, somewhat like everybody is different. Like that's the reason why I don't like to say, OK, this sign is just this way, because we got to look at their moon sign, their Mercury sign, their Venus sign. Like all of that plays a huge role into a person's psychology into a person's makeup, into their traumas, their their um, their goals, their challenges, all of those things. Okay. So the question now is, you know, our attachment style is literally ingrained in our psychological makeup. Like you can work towards changing it, but let's be real. Like you can't, it takes more effort to, to change something than to actually work with it. And this is the thing, like, we date people who are the opposites of us because they're here to kind of teach us balance. People who have anxious attachment style must learn from the avoidance. Um, the avoidance teach the anxious people that, you know what, it's okay to be independent, right? You shouldn't be codependent on your partner. Like, raise of hands, how many people in here have ever, like, got into a relationship or started dating somebody and it's like, you hyper focus on this person. It's like this person consumes your mind, you know, like you like and it's a good feeling. It's like when you when you fall into that moment, like falling in love where the brain releases oxytocin. Right. It's like kind of like dopamine, serotonin to the brain. Like it feels good to us. This is why people who are in relationships or people who are in love are more attractive. You ever notice like when you get into a relationship or when you're happy in a relationship, it's like, here come all your exes. Here come all these people who want to be in a relationship with you. You know why that is? That's because when you're in a relationship, when you're in love, you are emitting a certain um, hormone, frequency, pheromones that tells people around you like you're in love. You are more attractive. You have a glow to you. Come on, ladies. Y'all have a hear that saying like, oh, my God, you're glowing. Oh, my God, you look good. Like, yeah, like you're in love. And even the same, the same effect can be replicated by being in love with yourself, by putting that same love and attention into yourself, taking yourself out on dates, going, pampering yourself, going to the spa, um, getting your hair done, doing your, your makeup, little things like that that make you feel pretty and confident, right? So when... When we're in love, right? Like when you when you find somebody, when it's the honeymoon phase, it's like this person is always on your mind. But it might feel good, but it could become unhealthy because yeah, this person who may have avoidant attachment style might be into you. They might be they might be into you heavy, but you gotta realize like not everybody's attachment style is like yours. And sometimes when we're not aware of this, we can push people away. Right. Um, especially if you are anxious, because if your avoidant partner needs space to themselves, that can trigger your your abandonment issues that can trigger your insecurities that can trigger things within you. And um, the only way to really heal through this is really to talk about it. It's a vulnerable conversation. And I feel like, you know, this generation has been conditioned to be like, yo, you know, I'm not going to fall in love. Like, you know, I don't want to catch feelings. Like feelings is like a, a disease now. But it's like, yo, this is a this is a basic human emotion to feel loved, to feel admired, to, you know, to to be in this space of deep like whatever, whatever phase you want to put on it. And I feel as though um, people who have anxious attachment style need to work towards more so on, um, you know, codependency issues hyper focus issues um putting that attention more towards yourself and not making your partner you know not becoming a part of your partner not making your world revolve around your partner um and this is why people who have a vo who have anxious attachment style tend to take breakups a lot harder than people who are avoidant right because people who are avoidant you know they have this wall up like this psychic spiritual emotional wall that's up and when you're when you're intuitive when you are empathic you can feel this wall right like even when people come to me and get readings and their avoidance like i can sense the wall and i have to tell them like listen if you want me to do this reading for you you're going to have to put that wall down 
And I think that they don't even realize that the wall is up because people who have avoided attachment styles, these are people that once again, who never really had family members or friends or anybody in their environment that made them feel loved. They don't know how to express love. It makes them uncomfortable. These are also people who tend to go. These are people who choose toxic partners because subconsciously they pick toxic people because they know that the relationship will not work out and avoiding attachment people tend to have commitment issues and so they and they subconsciously pick partners that they know is not going to go anywhere they know that it's toxic they know that this person is not good for them but they choose it because it's safe to them because it reminds them of their childhood of how their mother didn't really love them or how their dad didn't really love them so when they when avoiding people meet people who are loving who are affectionate who want to give them like their all they're not used to that that's uncomfortable they're used to people not giving their all they're used to people like you know not giving them love or affection like they're used to people being mean and cold to them so i feel as though you ever y'all ever hear that saying you know people be like oh nobody wants a good guy nobody wants a good girl you know they just want fuck boys and fuck girls Men say it all the time. They'd be like, you know, these women don't want a good man. They want a thug. They want a nigga to run through them and play them and, and baby mama them. And then we hear the women that saying, like, you know, these niggas ain't nothing. You know, they don't really want to be in love. They just want to play with your feelings and all this other stuff. But we got to look at why we attracting these people. Right? Because obviously you're attract like you're gonna attract any type of people, but it's really about who you who you allow to stay in your space. Right? So when you meet somebody you intuitively tap in and, and you, if you pay attention, you start to notice like things about them. Like just start paying attention and observing people. You know, are they avoidant? Are they anxious? And then you know how to move. Because if you're dealing with a person who's avoidant and you, you know, you're blowing their phone up, you double texting, you calling them, blowing them up, like it's going to make them, it's going to make them like run away. It's going to make them be like, yo, why is this person so clingy? Why is this person like thinking about me all the time? Because remember, they're not used to that. Even though they may want it, like their soul may be screaming for it. But because they're so used to being tough, they'll act like, you know, I don't really want this, even though that might be the best thing that they need. And vice versa with the anxious people, you know, avoidance, the anxious people really need to put that time and energy into themselves, right? Like you got mad love to give, but why are you giving so much love to everybody else and your cup is empty when it comes to you? You feel me? These are just things to think about. And this is and this is what I mean by like when we're doing the work, when we're doing shadow work and we're doing healing, like, you know, this also deals with like researching, like reading up on things, learning about psychology, learning about the attachment styles, learning about your love language, right? Learning about your communication style. Because even when it comes to astrology, like everybody likes to look at the the Venus sign when it comes to love, but I think that we should also look at the 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 mars and mercury sign because the mercury sign deals with the communication how does this person communicate right are they openly expressive with their communication are these the type of people that will hold things in and not really express it until they can't take it anymore and explode right um looking at mars sign also tells us how people deal with their anger how people take action right if you are more of the go-getter the assertive one the one that's just like more motivated and your partner is not it could possibly explain why when you look at their mars sign because women we like men that are that that work harder than us i mean that's just me my mars is in aries feel me so well women and men is different right like for a man you will look at your venus sign to see what type of woman will be more ideal for you and when it comes to the man, his Mars sign also explains how he shows up in love, right? When he's in love, how does he act? It is vice versa for a woman. Now, with a woman, her Venus sign is how she acts when she's in love, right? And her Mars sign is the type of male that she's attracted to, her ideal partner, right? When we're talking about heterosexual relationships. Now, because my Mars is in Aries, I need my mate to be more motivated than me. My mate has to have fire. They have to have drive. Like he got to be a go-getter because I'm a go-getter, right? It's in my energy. I go for what I want. I attract what I want. Like that's just how it works for me. If I'm, if I'm with somebody and I notice that they're lazy, that they want things to come to them, that they don't really take an effort, you know, people that just talk about it, but not about action. I'm all about action. So if your words are saying something and your actions is not adding up, I'm not into you. So 
this is why you have to understand your astrology chart because it could tell you a lot about why you are the way you are, why you attract certain personalities and people to you and why certain things just don't work out, why certain relationships don't work out. You feel me? So at the end of the day, I feel as though we have a responsibility to our own emotions and our own attachment styles. And I think that, you know, your attachment style is nothing wrong with it. It's not no such thing as a bad attachment style, a good attachment style. It's just like, you know what, God or spirit gave you a certain hand of cards and you got to learn how to play this hand. You can't be worrying about everybody else's hand, what they got and all this other stuff. That's not going to help you. You got to realize, okay, you know what? This is the hand I was dealt. This is the this is my shortcomings. These are my strengths. So the best thing that I can do is work through these challenges, be aware of them. So that way, when these triggers happen, I know why they're happening, right? When I start going through these these anxiety attacks, like when I start worrying, let's say, you know, like, oh my God, why they didn't text me? Oh my God, why they didn't call me? Like I start going in my head. We start creating scenarios that don't exist, right? Anybody else can understand what I'm saying? Anybody else have like anxious attachment style? Like if you do, y'all probably relate to what I'm saying right now, but it's like, yo, your mind starts creating scenarios that don't even exist, and it's like, yo, if y'all know how powerful the mind is, it's like, yo, your mind can create that reality. Like a lot of the times, like if you're always thinking that your partner is cheating, like let's say your partner is honest, your, your partner is faithful. But if you're always projecting that energy, you're always focusing on energy, it's like you're creating that reality for it to happen. Shit is crazy. But... I think that we all need to work on ourselves. And it's Mercury retrograde. When is the Mercury retrograde going to be done? It's like sometime in May, right? Like May 15th or somebody. Somebody dropped the date below. I can't even um, think of it right now. But, um, but yeah, like, you know, I think that I'm learning from people who are avoiding attachment. Like, I'm, I'm starting to learn from people instead of, like, instead of taking everything as a personal slight. I think that if we just like kind of take every opportunity of everybody that we meet as a lesson to learn or something to take away and even some lessons to give, I think that we won't get so attached because I got to remind myself constantly like, yo, I came into this world by myself. I'm going to leave this world by myself. And at the end of the day, it's like you are the main character in your story and you know, you're going to meet people along your journey that's going to be side characters. You know, there's going to be some people that's going to play um, important roles in your life, right? Like, I don't know if you guys ever took like um, English or creative writing class in school, but you know, they got the they got the static character, which is a character that doesn't really have much, you know, depth to them. They just kind of play a, a very insignificant role, but they still play some type of role to help the main character, which is you. But they don't really stick around much, right? But they just probably have one little thing to do. So there's going to be some static, some static characters in our life, but we shouldn't give too much importance to them because they're not meant to stay here. And then you have your dynamic character, right? Your dynamic character is like the main characters. You have the main character and probably their love interest, probably their family, probably their close friends, um, enemies too. <laughs> Sometimes our enemies play a very dynamic role in our life. And so um, your dynamic characters, they might not necessarily have to be in your life forever, but these are people that have such an impact on your life that you will never forget them. Like they play a huge role in your spiritual development. You feel me? Yes, somebody put the dates. Thank you, Stanley. He says April 21st to May 14th is going to be Mercury retrograde. Thank you. Um, ha, yes, so Dada says, I won't keep giving away my character role. Yo, that is a powerful statement right there. Yes, Odaga, thank you for sharing that. You know what? I think sometimes as, you know, people who have codependency issues, we tend to do that. Like, we forget that we're the main character in our story, and then we start putting all that attention into a static character or to, like, a side character. But that's where the universe be like, that's when I feel like that's when things go left. That's when a relationship starts getting toxic. It's like the universe is intentionally teaching you like yo this is not about anybody else this is about you and these characters that come into your life are just pretty much helping you helping to redirect you back to you back to source back to the original being right because that's what this is all about like at the end of the day none of us are really separated from each other we all come from the same source we all are of the same essence um 
we're just we're just the universe experience in itself as an individual but it's really just an illusion i know that was a lot that was a mouthful but that's that's the theory that i've come up with um in life and a lot of this stuff that I, I gather is from experience. Like I can only speak on things that resonate with me. And I share that hopefully that it helps other people. Um, it resonates with other people so it can also help heal you and utilize these tools. Because we don't have to be slaves to our emotions or our feelings or our thoughts. Like we are in control of that shit. Like this is your reality. The universe is meant to all is mine. And whenever you find yourself spiraling, like, you know, those emotions start getting crazy. You start hyper focusing again and you going through it, going down that dark hole. Like what I say is move, like start dancing, start cleaning, start doing something with your hands. Like you want to get that energy moving because it's so easy to go into that depressive hole. And baby, let me tell you, OK, people who suffer with anxiety, people who have anxious attachment styles, even people who have avoiding attachment styles, like people who have avoiding attachment styles tend to go deal with their problems alone. Because remember, they don't know how to ask for help. They don't know how to be vulnerable. They deal with everything by themselves. They used to be in like the tough person in the family or, you know, the go to friend. So they don't know how to ask for help. They don't know how to say, hey, you know what, I'm going through something right now and I need somebody to be there for me because that shows up as weakness for them. And they have to be strong. They have to be tough because this is what they've learned in their childhood. You got to understand you can't change people. Like I think they say at the age of eight years old is like everything that happens from age zero to eight years old is like everything that kind of like builds our psychological makeup. Um, how we interact with others, how we talk to ourselves, like our inner voice, um, our voice with other people, how we connect and communicate our love languages, like all of that gets developed in childhood. And so that's why when I talk about like healing the inner child you're you're literally talking to your child like self trying to figure out what is it that you need to work on what is it that's blocking you from finding these things that you want in life because a lot of the times when we really just analyze things we realize that we're in our own way right we are in our own way like danger is very real right but fear is an illusion um and also our feelings are very real right but the truth is nobody can do anything to you without your consent Right. Like we can say, oh, my God, you know, he cheated on me. He broke my heart. He did this to me. It's like, OK, yes, this person did some awful things. Yes, this person lied to you. Yes, this person betrayed you. Yes, I know that that's fucked up. But but how we respond to that, what they did to us really is what's important. Right. We can't control what other people do to us. We can't. But we can control how we respond. Now, if this person lied to you, they cheated on you, they betrayed you. If you allow this person back into your life, what message are you sending? Because we always hear like they say a cheat was a cheater, always a cheater. I think that I think people can change. But I also think that when you allow this person back into your life after they broke that boundary, because it, it depends on your boundaries. Right. Some people don't have any boundaries. And when you don't have any boundaries, you set yourself up for disaster. That's why people who have healthy boundaries, they put things in place and they say, yo, listen, this is my deal breaker. I'm open to a lot of things. But if you lie to me, if you cheat on me, if you betray me, it's a wrap. And you got to stick by what you say. You create the boundaries and the standards for how people treat you. People are learning how to treat you by watching you. So how you treat yourself is also how people are observing. How should I treat her? Right. Like if you if if let's say, for instance, right um if you meet a woman and she got it going on like she's taking care of her health she's taking care of her money she's taking care of everything that's going on like a lot of guys will be like yo like you know what exactly does she need me for because she got everything what can i add and when we in a relationship with somebody i think that we should really be thinking of how can i add to this person's life how does this person add to my life or or, or am i just in this relationship just to be in it because some people take away from us. Like, why are you being with somebody that subtracts instead of adds, right? And I'm not good with math, but I feel as though a relationship should add or multiply. It shouldn't subtract and divide. I feel like if we come in together in a union, we are a team. And whatever you lack in, I'm supposed to bring that. Whatever I lack in, you bring that, right? And whatever it is that we're doing, we're supposed to multiply that together. It shouldn't be divided. Like, okay, this is your responsibilities. This is my responsibilities. This is like, you know, when I was younger, I thought that way. 
but I feel like, you know, traveling, meeting different people, experiencing different cultures, learning about psychology, learning about how different cultures date and, and everything. It's just like it's opened my mind outside of the Western thought. And it's like, yo, I really feel like Western dating culture is so backwards and fucked up. And I feel as though we got to get out of that by healing ourselves and learning about these attachment styles and love languages and going outside of our country and learning how other people date and how other people court and how other people deal with their emotions and communicate. This filter is wilding right now. Look at it. <laughs> I don't know if it wants to put the makeup on me or not. But that's how I feel. That's how I feel, y'all. So let me know what you guys think. I know we've been ranting for a little bit, but I wanted to share that tidbit with you guys because I feel like anybody who might be going through this, you know, um, relationship issues or just like learning how to detach, um, learning how to deal with your emotions, processing everything. I know it's a lot, but I feel as though, you know, just by educating yourself and being aware of your triggers, you're already ahead of the game. Facts. Word, filters bugging out, right? <laughs> it was Carlos. But yeah, that's Instagram for you. They've been bugging for a minute. But that's really all I have to say, y'all. That's all I have to say. And yeah, drop your comments below. Let me know what you think. Are you more of an anxious attachment person or are you more of an avoidant attachment person? Let me know below. Until next time, Kanja Queen signing out. Peace.